So we've had a few people request this video asking what's involved with us booking our European tours. So they want to know things about like booking the Euro tunnel or the ferry over to France, uh, how we book our hotels, how we decide on the hotels, how we plan the route, what we use to plan the route, what documentation is needed and legal requirements, what equipment we take, what cameras we're using. And the main thing is what does it cost? What does it cost us to get to France on the Euro tunnel or the ferry? What do we spend on hotels? What do we spend on petrol? And what do we spend on food and drink for the week? So I'll break the video down into each section and we'll go through them in a chapter version of me explaining it. So I'm now going to screen record the computer and I'll go through all the processes and I'll show you some of the current two we've got planned where the documentation is already there. And I'll probably show you some of last year's, which was Switzerland, where we know exactly what we paid. So we'll go through that now. So our main summer tour is normally about a week, seven to eight days. And we always pick the last week in July and it finishes early in August. What we do then, when we get back, we normally take August off because we all normally have family holidays. I start looking at destinations. I start looking on maps, having a look at places, what's about, what's to do there, what's got nice roads to it. And then what I'll do then is I will send uh, a group chat to the team. We'll have a little group chat discussion, seeing what everybody thinks, if everybody's happy with it. And then from then, I can then start making the planning. Once we've chosen a destination and we're happy with it, I then ask the guys who wants to do the tour the following year, the following summer. And what I do then is I will look at about the end of October at booking either the ferry or the Euro tunnel over to France. I inform the guys that we need to book the tickets by the end of October. So that's really the cutoff point to who's coming. And this is where we kind of have rules in the group. Although we're all best friends and we all get along, we still need to have rules when we're doing something like a tour. So the first rule we do is kind of like that for the tunnel tickets or the ferry tickets. We inform everybody that by the end of October, if you haven't paid for your tunnel ticket, then we're taking it, you're not going on the tour. And from that, we kind of gather then who's going on the tour, which it normally averages around 10. It's normally 10 of us what do it. When we book the tickets, we always book the cheapest ones, which are the standard ones. So they are non-transferable or non-refundable. And that's why we aim for the end of October is if you've paid, you're going. If you pull out, obviously there's no refund, you've lost the money. So once we know where we're going and who's going on the tour, what I will do then is I will look at prices for the Euro Tunnel and Brittany Ferries, just so we can compare the difference depending what side of France we are riding through really determines whether you're going to take the ferry or whether you're going to use the Euro tunnel. So what I'll do, I will pick just a random date for the Euro tunnel and Brittany ferries and we'll just compare the prices. So we're going to pick the dates that we're going to go out on a Friday and we're going to return on the following Friday and I'll just pick a random date in July so we can compare the price. So the price works out for the euro tunnel over to france in july is 145 pound return so that's there and back now if we use the ferry britney ferry prices seem to have increased this last few years so britney ferry there and back from portsmouth to cairn is about 273 pound so it's only a few pound off double the price of the euro tunnel and then once we've decided which one it is, I will book the Euro Tunnel or the ferry. Now, for instance, the Euro Tunnel, when you make your booking, you just book the date, put your registration in, say what type of vehicle it is, and then just pay. Once you've made that payment, you will then get an email from the Euro Tunnel, and you can then fill out the information. So it asks for your name, your date of birth, and this is where it can get a bit tricky when there's a, you've got a group going such as for us if we've got 10 going on the team 
I'm then relaying back to the team, I need your date of birth, your passport number, passport expire date. It can be quite a lengthy process because you'll put a message in the group saying, I need this information. Some will reply, some won't, some will miss the message, some will send it two weeks later. I'm then trying to chase it because I'm trying to pay for it. So you have to take things like that into consideration. So for planning the tour and planning the route, I use my route app. I use this because you can use Google Maps View in it. So you can kind of use the maps you're used to. It also allows you to export as a GPX file, which I can then import into my Garmin SatNav. And that just seems to work seamlessly. They work very well together. So what I will do, so let's for example say we are traveling by Eurotunnel and we're gonna arrive in Calais. I will then find out what our destination is gonna be. So let's just say for now, we are going to Arras in France. I'll then plot from Calais to Arras. I've then got the feature in my route app um, where I can turn off motorways and I can turn off toll roads. Because what we do and what we like is when we go on tour, we do as little motorway as possible. So we only get this one week a year for us to tour together. And we don't want to be doing that on motorways. We want to do that on nice country roads and some nice views. So we pick always non-motorway routes. So I'll pick the route from Calais to Arras. What I will do then, my route app also integrates with Google Street View. So I will go into the option then, and I will look at the route, and I try and do it with every road we go down. I will pick Street View, so I can have a look at the road, so what type of road it is, what type of surface, what type of views we get in. Sometimes I might tweak the route just so we've got better views. It might add a few miles to the trip, but you know, we're there to ride, we're there to enjoy it. And then what I do is I make each day its own route and its own plan. So the second day, if we was then traveling to, let's say Le Havre, I would then start from Arras, which was our previous night. And same again, I would plan the route over to Le Havre. No motorways, no toll roads. I'll then have a street view look at the road, see what kind of views we got. And I will do that for every day of the tour and then also on the way back up to Calais. So one thing you have to take into consideration, which we do with the tour, so let's say we've got a maximum of eight days tour. So what you kind of need to do is we need you need to look on the maps. So let's say for us, we're going to Europe. If we've got eight days, we've got to work out day four is probably the furthest we can go. Because if it's gonna take us four days to get there, it's gonna take us four days to get back or we can take longer to get to the destination. So we might take five days with less miles, but then the return journey, we've only got the three days, but we've got to do more miles per day. What I will also do probably over the next couple of months, so from October up till about December, I will keep going over the routes, trying alternative routes, different ways, just to see is there points of interest on the way we want to stop off at. You know, does this add extra mileage? Is it adding extra hours? Is it gonna prolong the journey or is it stuff we can do? And although on the map planning, it shows you what the mileage is and the time it will take to do that mileage. But that mileage and that time is if you are doing that route without stopping, without any unexpected traffic jams or congestion. So you've got to take into consideration, you're gonna stop for breaks, you're gonna stop for dinner. If there's 10 of us stopping at a petrol station, that's going to take 20 minutes at least just for us all to get through a petrol station filling up. So you can easily add two to three hours to the day by purely just having a stops, dinner, breaks, filling up and anything else what might happen along the way. Hotels, this is the big one. This is the one area what can change the complete tour. So what I use is I use booking.com and what I will do, I will look at say day one, we're gonna arrive in Arras. So what I will do, um, I will put in the dates we arrive in, the dates we're leaving, so if it's just one night, I then put in how many people are staying. What I will do then is I will use the side navigation just to filter. Because as you can see on the map, there's loads of these blue icons which showing you all the hotels and villas and B&Bs, whatever in the area. 
and the first thing I do is I use the amount. How much wood do we want to pay per night? We normally average and work out on about £30 per person per night. So if there's 10 of us, that's £300 per night. So I'll change the filter to filter out all hotels what are £300 a night or under £300. I'll then move to the next filter, which is free cancellation. It gives you flexibility. So if, say, we've booked all the hotels for July, then come May, some something major's happened and we need to cancel the tour, at least then we've got free cancellation. That can be very, very important because what that will allow us to do is if something happens en route, which as it did in France in 2022, where Alby damaged his front wheel and we lost a day trying to get his wheel repaired, that allowed us to cancel an hotel and rebook an hotel. The next thing on the list I will look at is I will choose twin beds. Just because ideally everybody wants their own bed. We have done it before where if we can't find an hotel and there's not enough twin beds, a few of us have had to have a double bed and we've had to share. It's not a problem, but it is nice for people just to have their own bed. And then as you can see from the maps, you see quite a few hotels are around the area. But as soon as you start applying your filters, it narrows down how many hotels are left. So if you've got three or four hotels in that area, what you can do, you can click on each hotel and it will tell you how many beds are available. Like for instance, one hotel, it might only have six beds. So that really narrows down our possibilities of finding hotels. Because although we've planned the route and where we're going, it's not till I start planning the hotels and I figure out, okay, that route we're taking on day number two, for instance, there's no hotels there. So I now need to reroute to another area where there's an hotel. But that can then affect the following days. It might take us over the daily mileage we want to do. But that just shows you how a larger team with requirements for the hotel, what limitations you're going to face and how it can change the tour and alter your route. So if you're doing a European tour, what you need to do, you need to look at the countries you're visiting or passing through just to find out what the legal requirements are. So this year we are doing going through France, Belgium, Luxembourg and Germany. Now we know straight away for France, the legal requirements are you must carry your passport, you must have the V5 document, an insurance certificate, your MOT certificate, a high-vis vest, and for France, you have to have CE-approved motorcycle gloves. It's illegal to ride a motorcycle with no gloves on, and it's illegal to have motorcycle gloves what not a CE-approved. There's a few grey areas with France. There was a rule that uh, France tried to introduce about you have to add reflective stickers on your helmet, but this got overturned basically by the European law where they could only say you could only enforce that if the helmet has been purchased in France. You can't enforce that law on something what's outside of, of France, basically. Another one is things like the carrying breathalysers in France. They made it law that you had to carry a breathalyzer, but they then later on decided there's no prosecution if you don't get one. So that's a bit of an odd one. They say you should have one, but nothing can happen to you if you don't carry one. So we class that as it's it's not necessary, we don't need it. And for the motorcycle, you don't need to carry spare bulbs and you don't need to carry a hazard triangle if you break down. Things you might want to take which are not legal requirements, which you need European breakdown cover for your motorcycle. You want travel insurance, NHS card, just with your NHS number in case something does happen to you while you're there. For all motorcycles traveling through France, you will require a crit air sticker and that's for the emission zones. Not all of France has emission zones, but it is a requirement that you have this crit air sticker which displays the emissions classification of your vehicle. But it is worth checking the other countries just to see what other requirements they might have, such as travelling in Switzerland. If you use the motorways, you have to buy a motorway vignette, which we bought when we went to Switzerland, and that was about £39. And we never use a single motorway in Switzerland, so we, we paid for it, but we never used it. And they're non-refundable, and they're non-transferable. So the filming equipment we take is the majority of us at least have one camera each. 
Now for myself, I've got my GoPro on my helmet. I've got an Insta360 on the front of the bike. I've got an Insta360 on the back of the bike. And I've got a GoPro session, which I use as my handheld camera. Um, and then such as Piggy, here will have a front mounted camera, a helmet mounted camera, a rear mounted camera. He will take his drone as well. So between us, we can be in 13 to 15 cameras. And what you must take into consideration with this is if it's a larger group and you've got a lot of cameras and you're doing a lot of filming, is how much memory you are taking up. So on average, when we did our Switzerland tour, I came back with 11 terabyte of footage. So I had over five hard drives of footage to go through. So the way we work is the lead rider, which is normally myself, I'm the person with a sat nav and who's got all the planned routes on. We try and get somebody in the middle of the group and somebody at the back of the group also to have the routes and plans just in case the team gets broken up or stuck at traffic lights. And the idea of a lead rider is that everybody follows the lead regardless of what happens. So whether you take a wrong turn in, if you get lost, everybody's still together. The last thing you need on a tour is for somebody to splinter off from the group, taking their own route and you've got no idea where they've gone and you have no idea if something happens to them. So the way we look at it is whatever happens, we stay together. If we take a wrong turn, we take the wrong turn together. At least that way, we are united as a group. So with regards to using your bank card in Europe, most countries, most places, and most ATM machines accept Visa debit cards, MasterCards, so all those are fine. But what I use is a currency card. Now a currency card is a direct debit travel card and the post office do these. I think there's quite a few other companies out there what make these, but I found the currency one is the best one. You can use it in ATM machines and it's free. There's no charge to use it in ATM machines up to 500 pounds. And the currency card, it on average you save 85% on transaction fees on what would you would save on your bank account. So for instance, I'm with Barclays Bank. Now Barclays Bank, their exchange rate's not that brilliant when you're using your debit card abroad. Where the currency one, I save 85% of that charge. You can use the currency card on all 180 currencies. And the way it works is the currency card is kind of, it's like a protective layer in front of your bank. So it's fully protected. And the way it works is, is whenever you purchase something, it goes through the currency card platform, which then contacts your bank to authorize a transaction. So these transactions you're doing is not dealing directly with your bank. So it's like an extra layer in front of it. There's no card number displayed on the front of the currency card, and you don't get those hefty exchange rate fees. A few of the team riders, they will just use a Visa credit card or a MasterCard, which is completely fine. You know, you are protected, but I just prefer the currency direct debit card. So a few things we've noticed when traveling in Europe, especially in France, we've noticed petrol stations, most of them are unmanned. So basically you, you arrive at the petrol station, there's no kiosk, and you put your bank card into the machine to top up. What we found on our very first visit to France is you will put your bank card in and it will say something like authorization deposit 99 pound, which you do see here in the UK as well. Then what we found was we was topping up our bike say with 20 pound of fuel. We then noticed later, about an hour later, when looking at our online banking, that the petrol pump had actually taken that full 99 pound deposit. And the reason it does that is in France, there's a bit of a delay before it actually checks and contacts your bank to authorise the funds. So what it does is it takes the full £99 deposit, it then processes the transaction within 24 hours, contacts your banks, takes the £20, and then maybe 24 hours later, it then refunds the £70-odd pound difference. Now that can catch you out if you're hitting quite a few petrol stations on the same day, and they're all a £99 deposit. So if you haven't got enough funds in your bank, although you've not spent that much, 
you can end up getting your card declined. But we did notice it wasn't every petrol station. So out of a week's tour, out of us probably filling up once, maybe twice a day, it was probably three or four petrol stations we noticed we was getting that deposit charge. Another thing to look out for is opening times of places where when we travelled through France, we noticed around 7, 8 o'clock, everywhere seems to close of a night. So sometimes we would arrive at the hotel at 7, 8 o'clock on the night and we couldn't get anything to drink, we couldn't get any snacks and we was finding it difficult to find places to get food. It's also worth checking what the cost of living is in whatever country you're going through. Because when we went to Switzerland, the cost of living in Switzerland is a lot higher than it is in the UK. I mean, for instance, we went to McDonald's and we had like a medium fries and a double cheeseburger. That was £18 in Switzerland. Well, probably back here in the UK, you'd probably pay five, six pounds maybe for it. So it was a lot higher there. And another night we went for an Indian curry and we ordered a plate of chips. Now the plate of chips in Switzerland was 15 pound. And that's all based on the average cost of living. So we found out the average wage in the UK for 2023 was approximately 36,000 pound a year. The average wage in Switzerland was about 60,000. So when you're looking at what the cost of living is, the prices were kind of relative to what people are earning. It was just a shock for us from the UK to go to Switzerland and spend that kind of money on food. Now this is a discussion nobody really wants to have, but if you're in a team or a group and you're doing a European tour, it is a discussion you need to have. And you need to discuss what will happen if something happens. So, for example, our scenario, we went to France, we was halfway through the tour, Albi accidentally drove over a raising bollard on the floor, which damaged his wheel. So his bike was unrideable. We had to wait for the bike to get recovered and for it to get repaired. Now you need to have a discussion with your group of what will happen in that scenario where we found out that Albi's bike was going to take nearly two days to get repaired before he's back on the road. What the rest of the group was facing was we hadn't got two days spare or two days to play with. Our hotels for the following three or four days, they were booked, confirmed and paid. So we couldn't cancel them. We, we were struggling to find other hotels with room. And you've also got to understand that people have paid to go on tour. So what we decide to do is in an instance like this, if somebody breaks down or there's an issue with your bike, the group will stay with you until you are sorted or until you are recovered or until you've got to an hotel. But the group will carry on its tour and you will have to make your way back home and wait to get repatriated. That'd be exactly the same for me. If I broke down, you know, the guys would stay with me till I got myself sorted, but I would then get somebody else to lead the tour and they would carry on. Because you've got to understand these guys have paid a hell of a lot of money to go on tour. So it's not fair to hold these people back. And that's, that's the agreement we have. If something happens, we stay with you, but, you know, your tour has then come to an end. Obviously, if it comes to something like, you know, there's an accident, you know, something you don't even want to think about, you know, that's a situation you're going to have to face at the time and, you know, make decisions with what's available to you and what the circumstances. So what I do when I book the tours, I create a Google Drive and I share this Google Drive with all of the, the group. And what I do in this Google Drive, I create a folder and I put documents in there. So we will have things like, we will have a funds document. So that will show how much people have paid in, what we've paid out and what their balance is. And the way we work it is we've got a Motorev bank account. So throughout the year, as we're waiting for the next tour, instead of everybody paying the full amount up in front, so let's say it's 500 pound, what it allows team members to do is they can pay 50 pound a month and just keep topping it up over the month. So that seems to work for us. But at least this way, the team can look at the funds document. They can see what they've paid in, what they've paid out, and what they still owe. I will also have other documents in there that will contain all our personal information, like our passport numbers, date of births, address, registrations, 
passport expiry dates. I will also save in there the GPX files will come uploaded to, to satnavs, so at least the team members, they can upload the routes if they want them. And then what I will do, I will create just a basic a website page. Just a quick reference for the guys, so they can go on that page, have a quick look, get, get some general information about the hotels, what the dates are, what the mileages are for the day, what beds are in the hotels, and we'll also have a document showing that who's sharing what rooms with what people. And if there's two beds in a room, three beds in a room, if it's a double bed, and all that information is included in there. So the most important part of the tour is what everybody wants to know, is what does it cost? I've got figures ready from Switzerland last year. So for a group of 10, catching the Euro Tunnel from Folkestone over to Calais was £110, and that was return. So that was traveling from the UK to France, and then from France back to the UK. Our hotels, we had hotels all the way down to Switzerland. We had three nights in Switzerland, and then our hotels all the way back up. And that was £264.75 pence per person. Me personally, for the seven nights, eight days we was on the Swiss tour, I spent £170.05 pence on food. So that was breakfast, dinner, evening food, any drinks I wanted, any alcohol on the night. And in a total for the tour, I spent about £160 in fuel. So in total for me, that cost £704.94. That was for seven nights in hotels, eight days on tour, all my food, all my drink, all my snacks, and all my fuel. Now that might be different to the individual on how much you might spend on food or drink and also that's including how expensive it was in Switzerland so I would probably take 50 to 60 pound off that bill and that's it that's how we book our summer tour it's quite long-winded it takes me a lot of time I get a lot of grief for it a lot of headache but it's worth it in the end so I hope you enjoyed the video I hope it helped Obviously, there's many of you out there who've done your own tours. You probably do it completely different. You probably book your hotels completely different. You probably plan your routes completely different. We've all got our own ways, but this is the way we do it, and it works for us. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next video.